Hello everyone, I'm Luke Kennedy and I'm ready to learn. How about you? Here's what we have coming up. In English, we'll look at advertising on toy websites and how it is made to be appealing. In maths, we'll continue our discussions about objects that take up space and we'll explore the moon's features in science. Let's begin with some new skills in English. If you've ever been on the internet looking for information about your favourite topics, movies, games or toys, you may have noticed that websites can be very persuasive. Advertisers are incredibly clever. When they create a website for their product, they'll use all of the tricks of the trade to convince us to buy it. Today, Pascal is going to show you just how persuasive websites can be. Hello. Today, we're going to talk about the internet. The internet is such a huge place. There are so many interesting websites on it. Everything moves so quickly, it's hard not to get distracted. So how do websites manage to hold our attention? You guessed it, they use persuasive techniques, using language features and visual elements just like other advertisements use. If they make their site appealing enough, we will want to stay longer and maybe even buy the products they are selling. We're going to look at advertising on toy websites that is so clever you may not even realise the site is selling you a product. Remember, when you research online, make sure you have a parent or adult with you. As you know, websites are not just places for information. They are also places where advertisers promote their products and services. What are some of the interesting toy websites you've visited? Who do you think toy websites are targeted at? That's right, children are the target audience of toy websites. They want you to feel like you need that toy so you will convince your parents to buy it for you. And we know that the purpose of a toy website is to engage you long enough for you to become a fan and want to buy the product. Websites have many ways to do this. They use language features and devices such as rhyme, alliteration, repetition and exaggeration, visual elements like graphics, layout, and still or moving images, and audio, just like other types of advertising use. You might have been on a toy website where there is a video featuring the toy or a celebrity telling you how good the toy is. But websites also have the ability to include interactive elements where you can get involved, such as games and quizzes. This is different from a television ad or an ad in a magazine. All of these techniques are cleverly put together to make the products more appealing to website visitors like us. Think about your favourite toy website. How do the language features, audio, visual and interactive elements persuade you? Let's have a look at a mock website for toys called Ginkies to see how advertising on websites works. Introducing new Ginkies. Think quick. Think fun. Build a Ginky city. Collect the whole set. Think Ginkies. Think fun. Get them online at ginkies.com.au. Okay. My first impression of this site is that it looks like a lot of fun with lots of bright colours and exciting images to grab our attention. So they are definitely using visual elements. When I first look at this site, I don't really think it's trying to sell me something. Instead, because there is so much information, at first glance, I think this is the site I'd visit to find out everything there is to know about Ginkies. So how do I know this website is designed to be persuasive and make me want to buy a product? My first clue is the massive heading at the top of the site that says, Ginkies, think fun. If we think about what we know about persuasive language, there are a few techniques being used here. 
The text is very large and it's in a prominent position, so we notice it immediately. It uses rhyme, ginkies and think, and think fun is a command that is telling us to do something. So already I can see that this toy website is trying to persuade me to do something, but what? It could have something to do with the visual elements, which are really important on a website. Images try to get our attention and make us want to explore the website more. The Ginkies website uses size, positioning and colour to do this. Notice the background of Ginkiesville. It looks like a racetrack with a start and finish line. I wonder if the Ginkies are involved in some kind of race. Do you think I am right? Let's look at the structure of the website or how we might navigate it. There are some very fun and bright looking pictures of the Ginkies on quad bikes and around them there are links to other pages. The website offers lots of exciting features to maximise impact and to sell the product. The text box on the left hand side of the screen includes vital information that changes when you click on a tab. We can learn who the Ginkies are about the Ginkies characters, how we can build a quad bike of our own, and how we can build our own Ginkiesville. We can even watch Ginkies on TV. The last tab is where I think the advertisers really want us to go, and that is the online shop. There's lots of text on the website which uses language features and devices to persuade. One of the particular things I notice is that there are lots of commands, which is a persuasive device. Things like, go to the Ginkies shop now and see the complete Ginkies collection. And, buy building packs in our online shop. Other language devices include exaggeration and repetition, such as, Ginkies are big enough to live in Ginkiesville, small enough to live in your pocket. And did you notice any nonsense words? For example, I have never heard of Ginky Tetrix before. Remember, websites often make use of interactive elements and this website has an online game I can even play with my friends. I can imagine spending lots of time on this website, getting to know and love Ginkies. What's your opinion of the Ginkies website? Do you think it is successful in using persuasive techniques? If you have access to the internet, explore your favourite toy or game websites and think about the persuasive techniques, language features, audio, visual and interactive elements it uses. Make sure you have a parent or adult with you when you access the internet. Well, that's it for today. See you next time. The My Place competition is back for 2020. This year, the Australian Children's Television Foundation and the Australian Literacy Educators Association are calling on students in years three to 10 to create stories about your place in this historically significant time. The coronavirus pandemic has reshaped our lives and historians of the future will want to know how this looked and felt for you, your family and your community. The 2020 My Place competition asks you to reflect on this moment in time and share your thoughts, observations and experiences through creative writing. Entries can be uploaded until the 26th of June.
Welcome back. I just received a special delivery. I ordered my mum's birthday present a little while ago and it has just arrived, so I'd better try and hide it from her. This box is quite big though, so that won't be very easy. Here's Annie to talk to us some more about objects that take up space. The world is made of objects that take up space. And in maths, we have a special name for anything that takes up space. They're called three-dimensional objects, or 3D objects for short. You may have heard the term 3D before. When we watch a movie in 3D, it seems as though the objects in the movie are real and are taking up space beside us. Here is a video to help explain more about the surfaces of 3D objects. In this video, you will learn about the features of three-dimensional objects. Let's look at the three-dimensional objects you already know. Cube, rectangular prism, cylinder, pyramid, cone, and sphere. Now let's look at the features of these three-dimensional objects. First, we will look at surfaces of a three-dimensional object. A surface is what encloses a 3D object. Surfaces may be curved or flat. Some objects only have a curved surface, like a sphere. Some objects only have flat surfaces, like a cube, rectangular prism, or a pyramid. Some objects have a curved and a flat surface, like a cylinder and a cone. These objects only have flat surfaces. This sphere only has a curved surface. And these both have flat and curved surfaces. Let's learn some more about 3D objects. Faces. Many three-dimensional objects have flat surfaces. These flat surfaces are called faces. All flat faces are two-dimensional shapes, like squares, rectangles, triangles, or circles. A sphere has only a curved surface, so does not have a flat face. Three-dimensional objects are recognised by their faces, just as you are recognised by your face. I'm a rectangular prism because my faces are all rectangles. I can also have square faces. I have six flat faces. I'm a special rectangular prism called a cube. All of my faces are square. I also have six flat faces. This pyramid has four triangular faces and one square face. A cylinder has two circular faces. A cone has one circular face. This dog toy is also a pyramid. It's a special pyramid because all the faces are triangle. I can flip it over and it will always look the same. There is no right way up, which makes it easy for my dog to chase. Now let's learn about another feature of 3D objects. Edges. An edge is formed when two surfaces meet. Some edges are straight and some are curved. Three-dimensional objects with flat faces have straight edges like a cube, rectangular prism or pyramid. Three-dimensional objects with curved and flat surfaces have curved edges. These include a cylinder and a cone. These objects all have straight edges. The sphere has no edges. And both of these have curved edges. 
Being able to recognise the features of objects helps us to make better designs. Let's look at one last feature of objects. Corners or vertex. A corner or vertex is a point where three or more edges meet. An object can have one vertex or many vertices. Let's count how many corners or vertices there are on a rectangular prism. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A rectangular prism has eight corners or vertices. Why don't spheres and cylinders have corners? A sphere has no faces or edges and therefore no corners. A cylinder has curved edges and therefore no corners. The features you have just learnt about will help you describe and compare three-dimensional objects. Let's count the vertices or corners of this object. One, two, three, four. This pyramid has four vertices. This box has six rectangular faces, 12 straight edges, and it has eight vertices or corners. It's a rectangular prism. This object also has six square faces, 12 straight edges, and eight vertices. This is a cube. This object has two flat circular faces and one curved surface and two curved edges. It's a cylinder. You're probably very familiar with this object. The mathematical name is a sphere as it only has one curved surface. And this is a cone. It has one curved surface, one vertex, one flat circular face, and one edge. This object is a type of pyramid. It has four triangular faces, four vertices, and six edges. We described and compared lots of three-dimensional objects today. We looked at a cube, a rectangular prism, a sphere, a pyramid, a cylinder and a cone. You could play a game called Guess the Object with someone. You could give them one feature of an object as a clue, such as, I'm thinking of an object that only has one surface and they have to guess the object you're thinking of. If they don't guess straight away, give them another clue, such as, this object can roll in, other, in any direction. See who can give the best clues. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. We love to receive the special messages that come from kids who have been learning at home. Today's clip is full of positive feelings. So over to Isaac, who will explain more. Hey guys, Isaac here. It's been great getting to know students from all across Queensland by asking them fun questions like what their favourite book or what their favourite food is. But today, we wanted to know what made them most proud. Here are some of the answers that we've received. I feel proud when I achieve a dance step that I've been working on for a while. I'm very proud when my hard work pays off. For example, when I'm playing the cello and I practice and practice a song for maybe two days and then the next day I get it very fluently. Well, one thing that made me very proud was when I received the Mr. Pat Weir MP for Condamine Education and Enthusiasm Award last year. I'm proud of how productive I've been during quarantine because I know that um, it's an environment where we can get distracted easily, but I've managed to avoid that, so yeah. The fact that like the whole world is looking down to Australia right now during these tough times and that I'm just proud to live in Australia. 
Performing in front of an audience with my viola and my singing has always made me so proud because I never used to think I could when I was younger. And now I know I can, and I know that my younger self would be very proud of me. I am proud of me when I do some prop ups on my trampoline. For EG. Good. Something that makes me proud is when one of my family members or friends achieves something that they've been working hard at. My proudest achievement so far is definitely being elected to school captain, as I love the responsibilities of having to run assembly. Since humans first set foot on the moon in 1969, there have been 12 astronauts who've walked on its surface, collecting samples, installing equipment, and carrying out experiments. During this time, we have been able to learn a lot about it. Today in science, we're going to explore more of the moon's features. Have you ever noticed the moon appears to change shape in the night sky? The moon has fascinated humans for thousands of years. Early on, humans observed the moon and drew pictures to track its changes, and they eventually started to create calendars because of its predictable patterns. Today, we use telescopes and spacecraft to study the moon. For example, in 2009, NASA sent a robotic spacecraft called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter into space to orbit the moon and record data, and it's still operating today. Scientists believe the Moon formed early in the solar system's history. It is currently thought that an object the size of Mars collided with Earth, sending rock into space, which was pulled together by gravity to create the Moon. Did you know that we only see one side of the Moon? That's right. Remember, the Moon doesn't create its own light. The Sun's light shines on the Moon. The light that is reflected enables us to see the Moon, so we only see the half that is facing the sun, and it's lit up. While the other half of the moon faces away from the sun is in shadow. Today, we're going to explore more about the moon and why we only see one side from Earth and why the moon appears to change shape. The moon is the Earth's only natural satellite or object that moves around or orbits the Earth. The other satellites that orbit the Earth are man-made satellites and are used to help us with communication and research here on Earth. It takes the Moon approximately 28 days to revolve or orbit the Earth. At the same time, the Moon also spins on its axis. Amazingly, it also takes about 28 days for the Moon to complete one rotation on its axis. This means that the Moon spins on its axis at the same rate that it orbits the Earth. Its rotation is synchronised. So this means that we see the same side or half of the Moon because the Moon, spin and orbit are the same length. This is despite the Earth also spinning on its axis and orbiting the Sun. Let's use a model to visualise this movement of the Moon in space. Remember, the Earth rotates in an anticlockwise direction on its axis. The Moon also rotates on its axis. While it rotates, it also moves around the Earth in an orbit. Let's take a look at this video to learn more. Remember, the sunlight reflects off the surface of the Moon. Can you see how we only observe from Earth one side of the Moon? Sometimes it is bathed in light and sometimes it is not. So why does the Moon appear to change shape? That is, why do we see the Moon appear to grow into a full Moon and back again? Well, we are actually seeing the different phases of the Moon. Remember, we can only see the Moon when the Sun's light can reach its surface. So, as the Moon moves around the Earth in its orbit, the amount of light that reaches it changes which changes the amount of Moon we can actually see. So, from our spot here on Earth, we see the shape of the Moon appearing to grow to a full Moon and back again. There are eight phases, 
Let's take a look at these in this image to find out more. Here we can see the Earth in the centre of the diagram in blue, and the arrows show the sunlight that travels through space and reaches the Earth. The orbit of the Moon is shown around the Earth and there are eight phases of the Moon shown in the orbit. Let's look at a couple more closely. Phase 1 is a new Moon. The Moon is located in between the Earth and the Sun and the back side of the Earth is illuminated, so we cannot see it. Whereas Phase 5 is located on the opposite side of the orbit and is in full Moon. This is because the Moon is on the opposite side of the Earth, so the Sun's light is reflected on the entire side, which we can see. The phases between New Moon and Full Moon are transition phases, where the Moon becomes more illuminated, or waxes, and less illuminated, wanes. So the Moon doesn't change shape, the only thing that changes is the amount of sunlight reflected onto the Moon as it orbits the Earth. People from different cultures around the world use their observations of different phases of the Moon in their daily lives. For example, Aboriginal peoples of Australia have traditionally taken advantage of the full moon for ceremonies because there is maximum light for nighttime celebrations and generally the weather is calmer. Also, the full moon provides an obvious planning date which everyone can see. OK, let's recap what we've learnt today. The moon orbits the Earth and rotates on its axis in 28 days. As the Moon's rotation is synchronised, we can only see one side of the Moon when it's illuminated by the Sun. And the Moon has different phases because different amounts of sunlight are reflected on the Moon while it orbits the Sun. Now it's your turn. You might like to observe the phases of the Moon, sketching them for your scientific journal. Or you might like to create a poster that identifies the phases of the Moon. Perhaps you might be inspired to write a story or a poem about the moon. Thanks for watching. See you next time. It's now time to take a brain break. Now why don't you stand up and enjoy your movement activity and while you do, I'll say goodbye because Victoria is joining Learning at Home TV next. Bye bye. Hi, I'm Lauren. Hi, I'm Emmy and I'm in grade four. Emmy, what's one of your favorite hobbies? Skiing. Me too. Can we pretend that we're at the snow now? Let's do some active winter moves, all right? Let's go skiing first, all right? Let's put our feet together and pretend we're skiing. Ski. Ski down that hill. Ski. That's it. Bend those knees. Oh, good skiing. Don't fall over. Nice. Now let's maybe try ice skating on the ice. Okay, ready? Let's gonna do jump from side to side. Big ice skating. That's it. Nice work. Balance on those feet. Good job, Emmy. What can we do next? Let's pretend we've fallen over in the snow. Ah! Full down. And then we're gonna get back up. We're gonna fall over in the snow again. Watch out! Balance. Oh, hop back up. One more time. Fall down. Oh, hop back up. Wow, that was fun at the snow. Thanks for being active with me today, Emmy. See you next time, guys.